It's a one take Jake, baby. Hey there, how you doing today? This is Chris Shiflett, as always, your host of Shred with Shifty, your favorite guitar podcast on the entire internet. Got a great episode today with my pal, Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke. But first, I want to address something I keep seeing in some of the comments on these videos, and that is people uh, saying things like, I look stoned. I want you to know that I am not stoned. I don't even smoke weed, nothing against it, but I never take performance enhancing drugs for these shows. Uh, I just have a really bright ring light because I'm old, man. If I don't have it, I look like this. So you don't want that version. You want the ring light version, trust me. But it makes me squint all the time. So I guess I look stoned, but I'm not stoned. We would never condone that sort of thing on a family friendly show like Shred with Shifty. Come on, you know me better than that. All right, we got that straightened out. Did you know that there is still time to pre-order my new record, Lost at Sea? It comes out on October 20th, and you can get some bundle goodies. The good folks at my label, Blue Alon, sent me a box of samples, so let's check this out. And you know what? I noticed some people complaining about my sales pitch in the last video. So if you can't figure out how to fast forward a YouTube video, then you just better sit back and enjoy the ride because this one's gonna be even longer. Look, we got Shred, oh, no, we don't have Shred with Shifty Picks. We got Shifty's Tackle Shop Picks. Can you see that? Can you see that? I'll tell you what, I think this is my favorite thing. I think, this, I think you're gonna like this, look at this. We've got a Shifty's Tackle Shop mug. Look at that mug, Whoop, how do I get that in there? Look at that mug, bright red, red and white. Kind of like a certain, you know, football team you might be a fan of or you might not be a fan of. Little squishy soccer balls. I got my logo on there. Little squishy soccer balls. Don't you want to get some of those? Those are pretty good. Beer koozies. Look at that beer koozie. This uh, kind of tumbler coffee mug thing for if you're on the go. For all you out there on the go, you got to fill that coffee, jump in your car, get to wherever you're going. It's like a keychain floaty little guy. I don't know what that does, but it does something good. CDs, vinyl, you know, there you go. Whoops, where's the camera? Where's the camera? It's really confusing when you're watching yourself on the screen. Look at that, look at that, lost at sea. So there is still time to get yourself a fancy bundle. Get on over to chrisshifflettmusic.com and uh, pick one up today. And while you're there, did you know that it is time once again for my third annual Hometown Holiday Hoedown, coming back to beautiful Santa Barbara at the Soho. Check out these killer lineups. We got Jim Lindbergh, first night, December 22nd. Jim Lindbergh, lead singer from Pennywise, plus surf legend Tom Curran opening the show. And then the next night, December 23rd, my good old pal Joey Cape from Lagwagon and the uh, bluegrass stylings of Gandy Dancer. It is going to be a really good time. So ho, 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 go pick yourself up some tickets uh, today and, you know, follow me on socials. And you can always watch the ad-free version of every episode of Shred with Shifty over on volume.com slash Shifty. All right, let's get to today's episode. Okay, on today's show, we got my buddy Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke breaking down his solo from Waiting for the Thunder. Charlie's not only one of my favorite dudes, but he's a guy with the most amazing collection of vintage guitars I think I've ever seen anybody take out on the road. And he's not just a guy that has all the cool gear, amps and pedals and guitars and all that stuff. He's a guy that knows how to make all the cool gear sound really good. He's got tone and feel for days. And you know, there aren't too many people in this biz that I, that I come across whose tastes run from like Randy and Eddie all the way to Don Rich and Roy Nichols. But, uh, but Charlie's in that Venn diagram of like, you know, classic rock, 80s rock and country, kind of where they overlap. Kind of like me, which is probably one of many reasons we became fast friends once, uh, once I went out on tour with Blackberry Smoke back in 2019. Um, I think we're about the same age and definitely grew up listening to a lot of the same music. Uh, I should mention right here that Blackberry Smoke has a brand new record called Be Right Here coming out on February 16th. And the first single, Dig a Hole, is out now, so go crank it up. But first, 
This is Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke on Shred with Shifty. What's up, Charlie? Welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm good. I will tell you that you are my first interview for this brand new guitar show. I'm honored. Well, I wanted to do it with somebody that I'm that that I know and am friends with, and uh, and 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 love uh, their guitar playing. So you were the perfect candidate. Well, I don't know what to say. I'm 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 moved. I'm honored, and I I love what you've done with the place. Look at behind oh, you. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Look at that. It's my new man cave. Yeah. If you could see, I mean, I've been like going to the. Um, you know, to the camera shop and picking their brain and buying like colored gels and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> wow. <to> get- <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, you know, that's not easy for me because I'm something of a Luddite and this has like forced me yeah. to. Uh, but that's part of, of what this new show will be. We'll sort of like, you know, not so much with the camera gear, but with uh, with guitar stuff. I'm I'm just hoping to learn. I want to be a sponge. What is what a you- camera? All I have is a is a phone. What is a camera shop? Oh, man. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll I'll send you my guy. Yeah. Yeah. I got a guy. Um, anywho, uh, crazy that we were just over in the UK at the same time and almost ran into each other. My first thought was like, wait a minute, they're on tour over. Why aren't we on tour with them? I know. Why not? Next time. Yeah, absolutely. How you was can... it? How was your shows? It was good for us. Was it good for you? It's fantastic. Yeah. Great crowds. Did you do the Hollyhead to Dover Ferry and all that stuff? The Calais to Dover rather? No, because we didn't get over onto the continent. We were oh. just uh, we were we kicked it off in Dublin and then um, and then went over to Glasgow and and worked yeah. our way down. Oh, I love Glasgow as well. But don't you love the the get on the ferry at two thirty a.m. and you you have to go upstairs and eat a full Eng- a full Irish or English breakfast? You have to. Yes, because um, you can't stay on the bus, right? You can't. They won't yeah. let you. It's illegal. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be on the bus when the ship starts going down either. That'd be that'd be pretty scary. I've done it before. I stayed. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just stayed and I wished that I hadn't because it was a three hour, 15 minute ferry ride. And I hope I don't have some, I I hope I don't cause some international incident by telling this, but. um, You're going to get banned from Germany. Uh, We'll edit this out. (laughs) Yeah. But the bus driver later was like, don't you ever do that again? Because that's extremely illegal. I was like, okay, well, I didn't wake up. Sorry. Um. We were talking before we started a little bit about that show out at the Ryman that that I got to open for you uh, just a few months ago, which I don't know if you know, but I've only ever played the Ryman as a solo artist. I played it once with Foo Fighters years ago, but I've only played it as a solo artist twice. And both times we're opening for the smoke. I love that. I know. Me too. I love your band. And I, 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 you know how um, Nashville shows can be in like, there's really uh, a lot of guests and family and stuff and friends, yeah. and uh, even though that's not our hometown, but it's close. Um, but I went down and watched it. it th- that Chris Shiflett show was new to me because I hadn't seen that band uh, and that show. And you were hitting hard, my friend. I was wow, blown, blown away, and and learned some things just a few minutes ago that you told me about the show that I didn't mm. know. But man. Great job. Well, you know, I got to say, I I went out into the crowd during, you know, we played our set and then went off and changed my shirt or whatever and stopped sweating for a minute. And then I went out into the crowd up where John was mixing up in the balcony. And, you know, the Ryman for people that haven't been there, obviously, everybody knows the Ryman. It's the the mother church and legendary venue and and a pretty magic room. And I went up to where John was mixing you guys up in the balcony. It just sounded so good. And if I remember correctly, the song that we're focusing on today, Waiting for the Thunder, your son came out and you guys actually traded off licks in the guitar solo, right? He did. Um, I was so proud. Um, I mean, as as a dad, that's like, as I have yeah. three boys myself. That I, it just it almost brought a tear to my eye watching it. I was like, oh, "That's the greatest thing ever." It was it was it was unbelievable, and it's something that he asked. Um, well, I asked him if he would come and sit in because he lives there, and uh, and uh, he, you know, he sat in with us uh, previously. He did um, fairies wear boots. Oh wow! Uh, and that was great. And we swapped solos on that. And uh, I kind of was like, "You want to do that?" And he's like, "Well, I don't want to do the same song again." <laughs> and I was like, "That's right. We yeah. shake it up. That's what yeah, we do." He's learning. He's learning. So um, I said. Would you be opposed to playing 
a Blackberry Smoke song. And he said, I wouldn't be opposed to that at all. And I said, which one would you like to do? And he said, Waiting for the Thunder. And then I said, will you play the solo? You want to do that? I said, it's it's awful naked. You're out there by yourself, you know. And uh, he said, absolutely. And then uh, and it, it just kind of evolved into uh, swapping licks, taking turns, you know. I mean, so with with your son and his guitar playing, have, did you teach him how to play? Does he no. take advice from you? Um, advice, yeah. Um, but I didn't teach him. I, I, when he was growing up, I bought him a... a there were probably three different times that I handed him a guitar um, as a gift. A little acoustic when he was a little kid and then a little electric as he got a little older and then a full on full size, you know, Gibson. And uh, I was trying to get the hook in him and uh, it and it wasn't working. He was like, OK, sort of just a little flippant about it, you know, more into skateboards, more into soccer, which and uh, but I didn't push because nobody ever pushed me. I think that I, that pushing is the wrong thing um, to do. And uh, so I just was like, well, it'll be there when he decides to come to it. And and it bit him hard. And it was because of Guitar Hero, the video game, mm. believe it or not. And it, it didn't come, and that's not playing, obviously, but it was information, the information that he got from that game. So Man, I remember him coming to me. songs in his head. Totally. He came to me and, and said... Uh, I didn't know Eric Clapton was in Cream. <laughs> I was like, oh, here we uh, go. I, you know, I, as I'm listening to you tell all, all of that. I have had a very similar experience, um, specifically with my youngest son. But with all my kids, you know, we sort of made them play instruments when they were real young. It didn't really stick for any of them, but my youngest son has come back to it recently. And, 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 yeah. and, and I, I love when your kids... Uh, get into the music that you love and know well, but they don't have any of your baggage right. or timeline with it. And they don't exactly, you know, they, it's, it's like all it, it, like, you know, music from the past. So they don't know like, no, this is the period that we think is cool. And then this uh -huh. period is, you know, not as cool or, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's the greatest thing. And I love to just kind of zip my lip and watch them explore yeah. themselves, you know? Well, I got to, uh, the uh, same thing or a similar thing. I started r reliving uh, some of these memories, like coming full circle to some of these memories. And he got very into the Allman Brothers and, because Jessica was on the Guitar Hero uh, game that he was playing. So he's like, Dickie Betts is great. I'm like, yep. And he learned that. And then Eddie Van Halen, that bit him hard. Mm. And, and that was... Me too. When I was 11, 12 years old, it was, that was it. That was the be all end all. And uh, I started to remember, I was like, oh yeah, you know what? When I was 12 years old, you had to choose. It was either Eddie or Randy Rhodes. You couldn't have both. You had to, it was, it was A or B. Right. And, uh, oh, those and, uh, were funny arguments, man. No way. Kiss is better than ACDC. Nuh uh. I mean, it was a real thing and, the, and we had fights about it. And I was like, right. well, I was always, I was always team Ed, man. That was that was our jam. And so he's like, yep, me too. Okay. Well, that's okay. Great. Because I wanted to get into that. How old were you when you started playing guitar? I was six. My dad, uh, he's a bluegrass guitar player and, um, singer strum. He's a, not a lead player. He's just a rhythm strumming guy and, and, a, a troubadour. And, uh, he gave me same thing. He's like, here you go. Cause I was always banging his D 28 around and he's like, well, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm going to get you one. And, uh, and then he taught me G C and D and how to, how to play wreck of the old 97, you know? And, and I was like, this is great. I just want to make music. I just want to, I want to make songs, you know? And, uh, and then, uh, I heard Led Zeppelin and black Sabbath and, and even the Stones and the Beatles and things that were on the radio at that time in like 1981, 82, you know. Sure. Um, but man, in 84, when I really, when my ears really opened for the first time, like really, I think, and I heard Van Halen, I was like, oh, man, OK. Then did you go back and like get their whole catalog? I did. I, well, the first album I bought with my own money was 1984. And uh and it was because of MTV and 
it was all that was all happening. 1984 was a big year for people my age, man. It was. Oh yeah, I think we're like, about the same age, and I remember going to the record store and buying 1984 when it came out. Yeah, they were just that's a Brandon, our piano player. We talk about that a lot. He's like, man, 1984 was a windfall of a year. I mean, with movies and music and pop culture, it was. It was pretty, pretty what, huge. What were the other big rock records happening at that point? Thriller was right around that time, right? Okay. I mean, um, um, or maybe that was 83. I can't remember. But. And it's in, it's in the wake of the first couple Ozzy solo records with totally. Randy Rhodes, who you mentioned. And it's in the wake of the first Dio solo record. Yeah. Which is a big one for me. The, the Rat uh, Invasion of Your Privacy or Out of the Cellar. Oh, right. Um, my right, sister right. was a big, she loved that. And and the, they sort of stood out for me as being a band that had really good songs, you know, and they had that really slick production, that Sunset yeah. Strip production, but they had really good songs. They had Warren song. D. Martini. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but she also loved Huey Lewis and the News. So it was really kind of all over the place, which also, who also had really, really good songs. And MTV at that point is starting to play all the heavy metal bands that, that I loved, which you yeah. couldn't, you know, up until that time, you never really saw, unless they came through your town, you never saw what these guys looked like when they were moving around and stuff. So that was, that was a big part of the draw for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at what point in all that do you go, Dad, this D28 is cool, but uh, I want to strat with a Floyd Rose. Like, when, when did you make that switch? <laughs> Well, he was not interested in any of that, so I circumvented Dad, and I went to Mom, who was a rock and roll person. She loved the Beatles and the Stones and Bob Dylan, and, uh, and I was like, I have to have an electric guitar, and she, she let me borrow $25, and uh, there, was a, there was a guy in my hometown named Bubba Lewis, and he had a guitar for sale, and it was a Mose Wright copy, but he had it all striped up like Eddie Van Halen, so I went down and bought it, and it had a Bigsby on it. Which I was like, well, that'll do that thing, right? It'll go, <laughs> but it wouldn't. It would only go, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I took it home and I and didn't then have put a, your guitar wildly out of tune. Totally. Well, he and, and he told me uh, I didn't have an amp, and he's like, uh, he taught me some some things on the guitar. He taught me how to play a couple of. Oh, I didn't know what a power chord was at that point. I only knew these. You know, the cowboy chords. Cowboy chords, yeah. He's like, look, no, this is way... And I knew bar chords, B-A-R-R-E, bar. -R -R -E, bar. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you don't have to do that full thing like that, man. Just these two fingers. You're there. Yeah. And uh, he taught me Iron Man that way, you know, and I was like, oh, shit, okay, this is a real thing. You know what's and, funny about the bar chord, but the, the B-A-R bar chord for me? Uh, this was yeah. a bad habit that I got into right away when I first started playing, which you just mentioned, you, you just use your two fingers. I just used my pointer finger and my pinky. Yeah. And that still screws me up to this day, because I was just going... <laughs> you know, like that, like that, instead of using three fingers, you know what right. I mean? And to this day, I, I think that I will never, like, have good coordination or, or finger strength because of that that one little technique mistake that I made when I first started playing. I don't know. I think that's all you need. That, that was Bubba Lewis's approach. Uh, hey, it worked for Bubba Lewis. Yeah. yeah it's been well, working for us all these years, too. So he told me, he said, uh, go home. Uh, you got a stereo at home, right? And I said, yeah, my sister's got a really good stereo. And he said, go to that stereo. You got a dual cassette deck? Yes, sir. Okay. In the headphone jack. And, and he, uh, with the $25 guitar, I got a, I got a, an instrument cable from him. He said, you plug the guitar in, you plug your instrument cable into that headphone jack, you put a blank tape in the record side of the dual cassette deck, hit play, record, and pause, and then turn the volume all the way up, and your guitar will come through the speakers. Oh, and wow. It, and it sure did. And, I, and, it, and it was all distorted and... And compressed and horrible. Really? But it I even like, had gain? It had gain. amazing. I think an accidental gain, we'll call it. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember in those early days before I, I knew how, you know, overdrive pedals worked or like, you know, a master volume or any of that stuff. And yeah. we just had this little like practice amp that my mom got because my older brothers played that just, you know, you could dime it and it wouldn't break up at all and just not understand like, why does it sound so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uneventful when I'm so playing. Nice. 
That Why is it so sound nice? like Randy Rhodes at all, man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I I think I wound up. There's probably probably uh, what I was doing with that stereo was incorrect, and and I wound up uh, completely destroying it. And uh, yet another fight for my sister and I. But, but 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 for a few days it was glorious. Oh, I bet. Were were yeah. you a disciplined guitar student? When yes. You we're learning. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you like setting the metronome and playing your scales and going, no, you know, I BPM faster every time and all that sort of thing? Not like that. It was more um, the rewind, play, learn, listen to the lick, rewind, play, rewind, play. Or we, even with the record with the needle, um, I had to figure out how to play, uh, disciplined in that way. Like I was not going to give up until I learned how to play those those licks and those songs. Did you take a lot of lessons? No, I I, I went for um, when I was young with the first acoustic guitar, the six year old uh, era. Uh, my dad took me to. It was a music teacher. He wasn't really a guitar teacher. He was an all around music teacher. He played piano and and banjo and guitar, and uh, he would just sit and jam with me. I remember he would sit and he he. He uh, showed me this little thing. He said, I'm going to show you this little Spanish tune. And uh, he would play this E7 and then like a, an F. And, and then he would, he would go like, just play, just go. And uh, it was like a, I'm a six-year-old kid and we're just jamming. He wasn't really teaching me any specifics. Like you do like this and you do like this. He saw that I just wanted to make a tune somehow on it, you know? Right, right. And, uh, and, and so, he inadvertently showed you something that sounds kind of like heavy metal. I mean, how great. I think what he was sort of instilling in my young mind was a little bit of theory, maybe. Mm. maybe and maybe he didn't even know he was doing that. But um, Do you have a pretty firm grasp of theory? Like, that's something that, like... I've sort Like, I took lessons when I was a kid, learned some basics, but I feel like I have a lot of gaps. Yeah, I, me too. Yeah, I don't think I have a full... Uh, understanding of what it even means to understand theory, but uh, right. I know it sounds good to me and what feels good to me. And um, I know it like song structure, when you start to write songs, you know, it's sort of, you rely on that. Like, and, and it really is what, what you, uh, what you like about the types of songs you like, you know, if you right. like songs to be 15 minutes long and never repeat anything, then sure, that's for you. But but that ain't really for me. So I like to repeat the parts that are that I think are that the crowd likes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when did it go? When did um, it go? You talked about, you know, Eddie Van Halen and some of the folks you were listening to that were the lead guitar players, which was that was a great era. That was like the guitar hero era. Yeah. Um, and so when did it go from you're learning cowboy chords and putting that together and maybe a couple of scales to like learning something where you went a lick or some specific thing that you went, I'm a lead guitar player now. Oh, you know, I think that, I don't know. I, Cause I would struggle, you know, with, and uh, I, I, I really wanted to be able to play like, like Eddie and I couldn't do it. Um, the well, solo no, stuff. Good. We all wanted to learn eruption and we would learn parts. And as soon as we got the tapping part, we're like, I know it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But um, I, maybe it was, uh, well, I remember um, uh, listening and loving all different kinds of songs, not just, you know, um, the heavy metal guys and, and even loving the cure. And and first learning that, and I remember thinking, well, that's a solo. I got it. Right. Right. So, um, I don't know. Maybe that was the first, the little solo lick that I learned that was like, okay, well, this is not not all that hard. <laughs> and that's that, by the way, is a great solo to learn because it's just straight down the diatonic scale. Yeah. You and know, I think isn't it like. That's it. Yeah. And it's there great. you go. Just every note in the scale right that's, there for you with the E droning right. out. It's a great lesson. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. And I mean, mess with that a little bit and it's all, it, and it's almost the love gun solo too. It's got... Well, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. Cause that's 
That, for me, I remember I was taking guitar lessons from my first guitar teacher who showed me, like I said, like cowboy chords, Beatles songs, a couple of scales. And then I switched to this other guitar teacher in town who uh, my friend was like, you got to go take lessons from Steve Miles because he's going to show you how to like shred. Uh -huh. And I remember like maybe the first lesson I took with him, he showed me a couple of those repeating patterns. Yeah. And that for me was like when it when I remember coming home from that and like there was a couple it was like <laughs> Like that kind of thing, uh -huh. and then the but the one that was really the most important was, you know, because that you could just do that endlessly, stay there forever. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. And I remember that was the moment for me that I just went, yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm a lead guitar player now. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the lady's favorite lick right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's all those ones. There's like those basic ones that like I still go to. <clears throat> like I'm I'm curious. Like for you, when you walk into a guitar shop, I think of it as like my guitar shop lick. Like yeah. when I walk into a guitar shop and there's a beautiful guitar sitting there and you've never played and you pick it up, there's we all have our sort of go to things that we do to you yeah know, to see what the action's like, to see what the neck feels like. Maybe it's plugged in. You see what it sounds like. Uh -huh. What's your guitar store like? I mean, that for what I just played for me is mine, you know, or like that kind of stuff. Like, what's what's the thing when you walk into Guitar Center to the Vintage Room or what, whatever that when you pick up that that uh, beautiful guitar? What's what's the lick that you play to check I, it out? I always play an A, A and E. I'm not sure why, because I because why not G? But it's always like. It's always a. I love it. what you just did right there demonstrates everything that I love about rock and roll and honky tonk and country guitar playing. It's that thing of like, oh, how do, this is where my lack of uh, of of uh, of um, you know. Uh, theory is going to come into play here but it's that thing of knowing when to throw in the extra notes the flat five the minor third to the major third the flat seven the six all that stuff and you just in that one little demo right there you kind of did all that well thank you that's well that's my my music store lick when did it get to a point for you where you weren't thinking about it and you were just doing it i'm not sure i i, I was thinking about this with i was talking to my son about it not long ago we were talking about hybrid picking and uh, mm. and i don't i remember struggling with straight picking trying to play fast you know and at some point my middle finger became a crutch and it and it i remember um uh talking with uh, nick perry who's a you know nick he's a great guitar player and uh, neither one of us, the same thing, neither one of us could put our finger on the exact point where it's like, oh, when did, when did you start to do that? You know, cause like Glenn Campbell did it and Clarence White did it and all these people, Billy Gibbons does it. I never even knew that until I started to see his hands up close and be like, oh, he does it too. Like on, he's using those two, you know, right. it's not never the yeah. pick on things like that. And it's, it's like. And then, and then it becomes a uh, something you're not even thinking about. You know, it's like muscle memory um, for the the songs that you're you know playing your own songs. Like, oh, I forget, or, or I didn't realize that I do. Um, I'm rambling now. I'm not even sure what no, your question perfect. was. No, but. yeah, that, that's exactly it. Because I know for me, like, I started doing that a lot when I the deeper I got into country music and realizing that plucky sound yeah uh, where that comes from and then like you said recognizing it in people like billy gibbons and all these guys that i'd already been listening to forever you know yeah there's a, a very in, different thing in the solo that we're going to talk about there's a one lick that is specifically a gibbons a gibbons ism right. um and, it, and you you kind of have to use that finger and a pick you know the hybrid together to make that to make this moment happen um or maybe maybe you maybe you can do it without it i'm not sure but well let's get into the solo let's start talking about the solo so we're going to focus we're going to drill down on on the guitar solo in waiting for the thunder um where and when did you record this song we recorded this in atlanta uh or north of atlanta uh, up in marietta 
uh, or Kennesaw, rather, Georgia, uh, in a studio called The Quarry. I think it was around 2015. Uh, we were making the record that would be known as Like an Arrow. And I recorded the solo on this guitar. That's why. Oh, um, really? That's why I got it out today. It's a, this is a 2014 custom shop Southern Rock Tribute. Ooh. Les Paul Standard. I think they, they call, why is it called Southern Rock Tribute? Who is it a tribute to? It was a tribute to Dwayne Allman. Oh. Um, and at the time, I specifically a tribute to Dwayne, but then also uh, at the same time, it was a tribute to Gary Rossington and Dickie Betts and Charlie Daniels and all these guys really? who played these burst guitars, you know. Um, so it's modeled and, after a 59? Yeah. And this is number 60. I think they made 150 of them. Oh, wow. Um, but it was a, it was a gift from the custom shop at the time, and it's a really good guitar. I took it on the road all of 2014, and I loved it so much. I played it every night, and oh, so wow. when we went into the studio and we were recording these new songs at the time, um, I remember this solo. I remember thinking it needed a, it needed a humbucker guitar, and this one happened to be there. I was like, well, that's a, uh, yeah, that that that'll work. And you'd um, already taken it out on the road and got some sweat and some scratches on it. Yeah, and it's completely stock. I didn't change anything. It's oh, wow. Custom Bucker pickups. And Does Gibson just, wine those themselves in the mm -hmm. custom shop? Yeah. Wow. Do you remember what amp and pedals and all that sort of thing you had going that day? Yeah, I didn't have a pedal. This was a 1976 50-watt JMP Marshall through a 412 cabinet with greenbacks. And it was... Uh, I've never been somebody who dimes my amp. Um some people do, I guess. I don't. Um, I just, you know, you find it, start at noon with every knob and then change the tone step go to where that. you want it to be, go from there. But I had it pretty, I had it, I had, I had it, uh, it was pretty loud because you can do that in the studio. You know, it was sure. rattling the windows, but, um, and it's fairly dry too, if I remember. There's not much, I don't know if there's any reverb on it. It's pretty, some, maybe some room. Yeah, it sounds real in your face. Yeah, it was dirty. Uh, when you're putting together a solo in the studio, um, what's your approach there? Do you, did you have it worked out before you went in? Do you just kind of noodle till you find the thing that's working and then refine it? Or are you winging it every time and every time it's a different, whole different set of licks? It depends on the song, I think. Uh, I remember not having anything in mind for this song. Um, I knew it was going to be stops and starts, and and uh, and so as a you know as a songwriter too, you'll think of a solo as like okay, well this is almost like another verse. Yeah. So um, it needs to have some uh, some theory um, and maybe a theme, you know, or some sort of it, following the melody is always a great place to start. I've sure. I found is is playing the vocal melody, but I didn't really play the vocal melody on this. But I noodled around for a minute and. Uh, and then landed on something that I liked and just kind of followed where it, where it went. Well, it's um, super hooky and lyrical. And it's like, I love when solos do that. You know, it's when, when you can sing the part. Well, thank like, you very much. Me too. That's, that's what I've always uh, aspired to accomplish is a lot like, like Gary Rossington, who just passed, you know. But his, in a three guitar band like Leonard Skinner, his solos to me were the ones you could sing. Right. Yeah, I imagine like the whole crowd at a Blackberry Smokes uh, show singing along when you're playing these licks. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so when, what's it like in the room? Do you have all your bandmates, and I'm speaking from experience here, all your bandmates on a couch behind you, sort of short order cooking you while you're, while you're <laughs> working it out? <laughs> or are you no. like, get out of here, let me do this? No, they leave now. Yeah, they're, Paul might stay and Benji might stay. Uh, the guitar players, but everybody else is like, screw this, I'm going to Waffle House or something. <laughs> Have fun with your little guitar day. Well, here, another question, because I've, I, you know, I struggle with this sometimes myself, even just within an album or certainly within the context of your whole career. How do you, do you think about not repeating yourself when you're putting solos together? Yeah. Um, and I have repeated myself. I've, well, I've, we all do. I mean, yeah. I probably have three licks that are pretty much in every solo I've ever done. <laughs> you know, that's you, it. You, you go out from there. But like, is, I always wonder with other players if that's something that's on your mind. Like, I just put this in this other song. I can't do uh -huh. it again. It's too <laughs> No, I, I always, I always uh, stumble upon it later. I'm like, oh, damn it. That's the lick from, you know. Um, 
But it's like you said, sometimes it's uh, the things that Tom Waits said that our hands are like dogs and they go to familiar places. Mm. That's a good well, line. I guess that's what we do. Well, I always love that about Eddie Van Halen. Like when you when you listen to a lot, there's there's certain themes, certain things that he does in a mm-hmm. lot of different solos. We're like, oh, it's that thing again from the one. Yeah, you know? I mean, that that's kind of beautiful, really. Totally. Like, I mean, it worked for Chuck Berry. Well, especially if you're lucky enough to have like a long career and make a lot of records, I think it's yeah, it's great. Charlie, I feel like we've done a lot of talking. Let's we get have. To, let's get to some playing. Let's I'll do wait. it. Are you ready to play the guitar solo in Waiting for the Thunder real, real slow so us mortals can get a grip on it? I am ready. All right, let's, let's do it. So I love this solo like we talked about. It's perfect for what we're doing today. It's broken into four sections, four uh, separate licks and ideas and themes, and it does what, uh, what great solos do. It's, it's, it's singable. It's hooky. Um, and it's, it's right there, just like 99.9999% of, of every guitar solo I do. It's in that minor pentatonic box, but with some extra sizzle thrown in there and some overbends, what I love, and a lot of style. In this first section, you're kind of starting because we're playing, you're playing over the verse, essentially. And yeah. you're kind of aping the, the vocal line a little bit, but, not, but then it quickly deviates and turns into that great thing where you're sort of overlapping. I love when solos start a little low, too. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. It, uh, uh, what we probably didn't talk about earlier about solos is building a solo. Like building, you, you don't want to come in. Maybe you don't want to come in with your hottest lick, you know, blazing. Um, and it a, a low starting low is a always a always a great place to start there and work your way up to the up to the the where the dust is up here. yeah and we should probably tell people this is in the key of b it is in b b yes. natural so b i natural. came out of the uh that's the lick that's going on while the organ is playing and then coming out of the and then the first lick is and that's just a little you know like a vocal kind of turnaround and then right after that is the little Gibbonsism I was talking about. Yes. Um, that's it goes. Uh, so I'm picking the the E or uh, the A string up there at the ninth fret, and underneath it at the seventh fret. On the D string, I'm plucking with my middle finger. So and there's, lot, there's lots of style points there because you've got not only are you doing that 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 pluck, but you're letting those those notes overlap each other. That's where you yeah. get that good that flat seven thing happening over it. It's got the slur. Tom Bukovac calls it the slur. Yeah. And I like I like what you do there with your vibrato because that's again style points for the style points for the whole thing. But the the vibrato with the with you know it's I love how you you know when to when to have the slow vibrato, but then when to give it that like shaky hand. No, well, thank you. And Eric Clapton, there, there's a video where he's talking about you know uh, the person has asked him about soloing, and he's like, it's singing. It's it's just your instrument is singing. Right. So coming out of the that might be something that a, a singer would sing. You know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I often wish that I could sing with the reckless abandon that I can play guitar. <laughs> I mean, how <laughs> great would it be? Do not, do not line up necessarily. Sing like Chris Stapleton. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But, oh. We'll just continue to do this then, Chris. I can't you. sing like Chris Stapleton, but my name is really close to his in the That's record. Right. Yeah. It is. It's right <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, all righty, cool. So what so it is so let's just recap that. That's right. Is that about right? Yeah. 
and then you're out of it for the big. Now, when you're playing that live, do you go back to the chords? Or are you like, we got three guitars in this band. I'm just, I'm going to hang up here. I'm just going to do this for a second while I can uh, reset. Uh, yeah, I let, they, they handle it. Nice. Um, and the, the beauty yeah, of a three guitar band. That's Live right. Guitars. Yeah. That's right. When you slide up to this next section, are you sliding up to the fifth? It's one of those things that kind of flies by, so it's hard to know exactly. Are you? But are you sliding up to the fifth and then doing that minor third to the major third thing? Um, yeah, I'm still staying on the F sharp note there yeah. uh, that we just came out of there. So now I'm go back up to it, and that's just a chord shape. You know of the B, and are you so getting? Are you doing multiple notes up there? Is it like a um, like a uh, double stop kind of thing, or is it single note? Just single notes. And I'm pluck. I'm again. I'm plucking, plucking the the A string with the pick, and then grabbing the G string. <laughs> Yeah, it's and that middle finger's working through that whole that whole little part. Right? That's right. That's my dog. He's helping out. Oh, Diggs, good. Hush. No, a we we want to hear his opinion about your tone, man. Well, he loves that. He that do- he's excited about that double stop lick. That's his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you trained your dog well. I love it. <laughs> so that yeah, the uh, and you kind of mute those notes a little bit. They're not wide open. They're a little bit hushed. You know, kind of like. Oh yeah. So are you and are you sliding in on each one of those? Yeah. Are you kind of sp- sp- yeah. sliding? Oh yeah. I think I played over you when you were doing that. But give it, give it to us one time, real slow. Ultimate style. I love that kind of that. Um, I can't obviously play like Jeff Beck, but he would do so many of those sliding down two notes. Right. That was, right. and that's so that's that's different. And when it, I don't know about for you, but when I hear something like that, it's all it's a, such an ear catcher. Like oh, totally. And okay, it's all that, like I wonder if that comes from actual slide guitar playing because there's a lot of that in maybe slide, you know where that sort of reversing directions thing. Uh huh. Maybe it's something that Derek Trucks and he does with the slide. Like he'll come from from an extremely high position to a way down right. into a. Um, yeah, buddy, you get them. Yeah, you get those. You get those. Like, uh, like what's the one I'm thinking of? Well, I don't have a slide on, so that doesn't sound good. We're gonna edit that out. It's probably the hardest lick in the solo. It is, yeah, and it was. It's hard to match. I sort of like. With a lot of this, I would like feel like I got close, but I didn't really get exactly what it was, you know. But this I love because it's two big overbends in a row, where you're yeah. bending. The first one's bending up from the tonic to the minor third, and then the second one is, uh, I think, is you're bending up from the from the fifth to the flat seven. That's it. Yeah, love it. The, Let's this, see, can you can you yeah, demo that for me slow? The start of the lick is that it's a stretch. It's a it's a sort of a pedal steel lick. Um, so you're coming, you go. So you're doing the uh, that double stop up into that pentatonic, you know, yeah. minor. Uh, then you stretch your index finger way up there to the to the seventh fret. That's, that's the kind of that's the kind of lick that I worry about for the whole show. Knowing I do too. That it's on the horizon. <laughs> I do too, and I flub it. I don't always get it. Um, and I, I've seen people go, which would be similar, but it ain't right. It's not right. The... And it should be noted you're doing this with a very dry, unforgiving tone. It's got yeah. some wit on it, but it's very unforgiving. So when you miss that note, everybody knows it. Everybody knows. It's a great big... Uh, I, I saw an interview where the guy said, that's a great big matzo ball hanging out there. Um, but I, as I listen... That's it. 
Yeah. That's, it. That's the hard part. So when you when you're doing that, are you are you only really uh, picking the first note when you get to the B string, and then the rest of it's a hammer on and a bend? Yeah. Now, how, how do you approach that? Like for me, when I'm doing like anything over a whole step bend, I'm sort of throwing caution to the wind. I'm not super concerned if it's right on the money, if it lands. It's just more like that Mick Ronson, you know, just just reckless abandon. That's it. This whole solo was that way. It was like um, I remember. Um, playing some things and being like, well, that's not quite right. And the engineer, Billy Bowers at the time was like, who cares? Just play the shit out of it. Even if other strings ring, even if you get the last note of this solo is a great example of getting the B string accidentally caught up with the E string, oh, that little yeah. thing. You know? The grit, the grit. And, and, it, and it, it happens when it happens, it's beautiful. And then when it doesn't live, it's like, ah, oh, I really wanted that other string to get in there and make some noise. Isn't that funny? I feel like we spend a lot of time sometimes in the studio uh, engineering those kind of mistakes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're looking for that mistake. Yeah. You know? It's got to it's gotta happen. When it doesn't happen, it's like, ah, oh, shit, now it's boring. Exactly. Um, this, this solo, I, I even, uh, there were a couple of times where, cause another thing about this solo is the guitar is the rhythm instrument throughout because there's nothing else going on so it really is played in the rhythm of the song it's not it doesn't jump time anywhere there's no uh, it's not uh it's just not polyrhythmic you know it really and i have played it before and tried to add a little polyrhythmic thing and brit our drummer would be like what are you doing now i don't know where we are in the song <laughs> like how, do you, for live do you tend to um i mean for for a, a solo like this it's like it's it like i said it's hooky it's like a part of the song that you could sing to so do you play it more or less like the record live i do this do you one you do yeah and i mean i may um i may um well, not even, no, I, I never even really ad-libbed this one. It's just, it, I played the licks the way, I may play them a little differently uh, with a little different feel. Who knows, you know, it's according right. to what the night feels like. But but that was a great example of, I, I, I tried to go out a little out there one night, and he was like, don't do that, I'm going to get lost. Just play it like it. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, man, man. I'll you, keep it. Do you remember how many times uh, you, because uh, it sounds so fresh on the, on the record. Do you remember how many times, how many takes you took? To, Not many. To this one. Not many. When I, when I, I think I maybe had to fix a couple of the, because they're so separated, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it didn't take very long. I remember, um, I think Benji was there. Um, but I remember thinking, that's fine. Why, why, that's, that's good enough. It's why hard sometimes in the studio to not overthink it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have been guilty of, of uh, I heard a story once about a famous guitar player that we all know and love, who I won't name, who just kept on and on and on with the, with, uh, the perfectionism and was like, no, no, I got to get this. Comp no, it's not right. And, and uh, just like pulling his hair out. And finally was like, all right, I'm done. And the producer said, are you done? And he's like, yes, I'm done. He goes, good. Now all those people who are going to take the record back will keep it. I thought you were heading to, now we're going to use take one. Right, exactly. Well, yeah. probably so. But uh, no, that, that one, it didn't take very long. And when I listen to it here with you, it's really raw. It's really... Uh, oh, yeah. And it doesn't sound like it's completely in tune. <laughs> it's, well, that, it's, really... it's, it's funny because this lax section that we're about to get to, this was the part that was the hardest for me to get a handle on. Okay. Are you doing a bend from the 15th fret that gets all like two steps up? Yes. I don't even know what we call that in theory terms. I'm, somebody comment in the comment section. Let us know. Yeah. But it's like you're going from like. That's it. So this one really, I like, I, I even put it in my amazing slower downer app and still couldn't quite work it out. Because I was playing it like the way I would approach it, which would be like. But that's not it at all, right? Yeah, it's a. What are the first couple notes real slow? It's uh That's the first two. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's it. And I'm just ripping off Mike Campbell, sounds like. Well, that, okay, let's talk about what that is for the young guitar players at home. You've got, uh, what is that? That's the sixth to the, that's like a major, that's like exactly what we were talking about before, where it's a, a little bit of the major scale, a little bit of the minor pentatonic thro- yep. thrown together. So you're going from the sixth to the, to the tonic up to the minor third, yep. and then all the way up to the fifth. That's it. God, I love that lick. That and that totally is uh, like you know that song "The Steeler" by Free, uh, Paul Kossoff, where he goes. Oh wow! So that same kind of. Where, that, where are you? Is that where are you playing? What Just, note are you bending up to right there? And and that's that part of the building of 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 the waiting for the thunder solo. It it it, did, it never felt like it needed anything to be played fast, like a fast lick. But it needed something extreme, um, a little unhinged, and uh, that was about as unhinged as I could get. as a bend that, uh, and that that again, like you when you when you mentioned earlier, like live. I never know if it's going to be a good clean bend or it might have every other string ringing at the same time. <laughs> Right, the more the merrier. That's yeah, because right. that's 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 an amazing thing. So you've got a, there's a lot going on there. You've got that uh, major scale to minor scale thing. You've got the big giant, the biggest overbend of the whole solo, and then the grit, the noise. Yeah. That's it. Love it. <laughs> Gotta grab those two notes on accident. Well, that's the whole solo. Could you, would you be so kind uh, so we don't get sued by YouTube or whatever? Um, yeah. And just play it for it in its entirety. Sure. So come out of it. I was very tempted to play the chords behind you, but I don't know if Riverside has a latency issue. And if I it was screw it up. <laughs> remember when you and I played I'll Be You on Instagram Live? Do you remember that? Yes. During yes, COVID? Yes. And I'm sure it didn't line up at all, but boy, it was right. fun. Yeah, but we, you know, those were the early days of lockdown when we were all struggling to figure uh-huh. out how to entertain the people. My wife watched it on her phone uh, in another room in this house, and she was like, that sounded weird, babe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if your wife is like my wife. My wife pretty much says that regardless of latency. Yeah. Um, hey, I, I, uh, I thought it would be fun to ask the people if they had any questions for you. And I got some good questions off, uh, off the internet. Oh, okay. Um, first one from Kurt Cornell is uh, ask Charlie Starr if he ever tires of kicking ass. Never. No, Never. I'm, I'm too oh, young. I do that. I'm I do still- that. I'm still too young, Kurt. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And when you talked about uh, buying your first record in 1984, you really meant 2004. I know. That's that. right. Yeah. There were also a lot of questions about your pedal board, but um, we could just direct people to your rig rundown, which I saw you filming, but I haven't watched the actual rig rundown. But if yeah. you want to just do a, maybe a quick, uh, like, what's the one go-to pedal that you just can't live without kind of thing? Well, I got a couple of those. I, I love uh, Analog Man. Uh, Mike Pierre, he makes great stuff. I love um, he, he. I love his fuzzes and his Beano Boost and the King of Tone, which I'm using right now. Um, just unbeatable stuff. Um, also, uh, Piedmont Electronics, the Aluminum Falcon. Um, I don't have a real Klon because I don't want to spend. 
I would love to have one, but I don't know that I would be allowed to spend five thousand dollars on a pedal. <laughs> but but that's and, why you uh, have those purchases shipped straight to your studio. Not yeah. that I'm saying I do that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I send them to Chris Shiflett's studio. There um, you go. But I have a really nice, uh, a nice sounding clone of of the the famous clone called the uh, Aluminum Falcon. It's really good. Um, and and the uh, uh, the Super Trim full tone. Tremolo. Um, I uh, use it. I even use it with amps that have tremolo. I just love the sound of that pedal. Um, how do you set it? Like nice and slow or real? Blah, 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 blah. Um, it depends. I, I kind of have an off and on really where um, just to, if I wanted something extreme, I could get down on my hands and knees and change it, you know, but, but I kind of keep it pretty, pretty strong. The intensity is pretty strong, but not terribly fast. But are you? Do you do much of that live? I'm trying to think if I've ever seen you get down on your knees and start adjusting delays and things. No, that looks bad. I, I'm not into that. <laughs> I'm not into that. <laughs> the older you get, the harder it is to get back up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Here's another one from uh, from uh, Sky Dog Disciple that that I this got my attention because I always think about this myself. He wanted to know about your tone for slide guitar. Because you're a great slide guitar player, um, I know. For me, I always feel like I, I, I'm, I grit my amp up too much, but I want that all that grit because I feel like if I don't, I'm, then I'm not getting sustained. So, how do you like? What's your amp pedal settings for when you're playing slide? I don't do anything different really um, for slide than than for just playing with my fingers. But um, um, it'll be a specific to the guitar. Um, um, and juniors are really, they like to, they like slide because they, they have a lot of sustain and they're, they're a gritty, mean guitar anyway, you know, more so than a Telecaster and Esquire. Those would be a little tougher. I don't, I'm not, I'm not playing a whole lot of slide on a Telecaster. Do you jack the strings up like the action? Or no, do you just I, play? Man, I like how it. Pretty, how do you do that without clickety well, clacking on the frets? Well, I like it pretty high anyway. Um, oh, okay. I like, um, not terribly high, but, but, um, I like my, my action a good bit higher than Paul does, for example. He likes slow action. Um, and it's just a preference thing. Um, yeah, but he plays through a helix, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I, I like to get in there and dig uh, on most guitars for – it just – Tonally, there'll be there'll be some sweetness there that you might not have on a guitar that has lower action. For me, anyway, that's just a, my my personal preference. Yeah, it's um, nice when they fight you a little bit. Like it, when you, when you're playing slide, do you have uh, a little slap delay or like a long delay? You put anything on like that on there? No. Uh, well, sometimes there's a couple songs where I will there there's some delay with the slide, um, uh, and it'll be a longer delay, um, uh, but not much. And I and I will use uh, that that clone pedal um to give it a little more there's a little more compression and a little more gain there and even you can turn the volume knob and lose some of that gain but still kind of retain some of that compression and some of that power so you can keep the sustain for the slide but as i say that i watch Derek trucks play through basically you know he likes a super reverb that's his sort of the 6l6 amp and he plays with really low action, and it sounds like he really likes for his slide to hit the frets. And it sounds cool. You can hear him sometimes like there's a strange little nuance that happens when he plays, and he has no problem whatsoever with it. So, But he's the king, so who knows? Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Spicy Beans wants to know, and I think this is an interesting question here, too. And since I know you to be a bit of a gear hound, I'm curious to hear your answer here. If you were going to Frankenstein uh, a guitar together, what would all the components be from each one? Huh. Like, what would the final product be if you're, you know, like the Eddie Van Halen Frankenstein guitar? Like, if you just took the neck from this and the pickup from that and the body from, you know, what would that, what would that wind up being? You know what? It would be a piece of mahogany body, like a Les Paul Jr., and it would be a an early to mid '60s uh, rosewood fretboard Telecaster neck, Telecaster or Esquire, nice beefy one, um, with a Bigsby and a P90, and uh, maybe a maybe a PAF in the neck. Ooh. That's my Frankenstein guitar. I love it. Yeah. Do you own that guitar that you just described? Is that I, in your vault somewhere? I don't. 
It needs I to be. Think. Oh, it need, and it needs a B bender too. Oh, there you go. Well, now <laughs> I know what to get you as a uh, yeah you know, as, a, as a thank you note for uh, for being on the show, dear Fender. Yeah. <laughs> Could you relic? Uh -huh. Exactly. This. <laughs> uh, since we're on, we kind of talked about this with slide, but somebody wanted to know your uh, string action and like uh, string gauges and pick gauge. Well, I like 10 to 46 for strings. Um, that's all I've ever really used. Picks, I like head, fin basically like old Fender heavies. Um, these are in tune GP, but the, it's the heavy gauge. Well, what shape is that? Is that like a triangle shape? What is that? No, it's just a oh. little... It's okay. a blackberry smoke pick. Oh, look at that. Love yeah. it. Um, I tried those um, Dunlop. I dog. Oh, my see? dog's on my pick. Your dog? Yeah, my little I dog. That. I used yeah. to put my kids on there, but then I wound up switching it. Fantastic. Your kids are like, don't put me on your pick, Dad. It's not <laughs> yeah, cool. they're, they're old enough now. They're like, dude. Yeah, enough. stop it. Yeah. We get it. You love us. Yeah. It's cool. Just yeah. please stop. I'm a, gr I'm a grown up, Dad. Stop yeah. doing that. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I cut you off when you were explaining something about your pick. Oh no, just that it's. Uh, I, I tried some uh, the Dunlop, like the uh, remember those uh, Herco, with the they they kind of rough on oh, either yeah. side. Yeah, dig those, dig those. And uh, the, they had they sound good. They have a thing, and uh, but then uh, just for simplicity's sake, it's like okay, these are fine. Dude, you are so great. I love you. I love your guitar playing. I love you and too. You are just a wonderful, wonderful human being to talk to. And I feel like I learned a lot in this interview. And um, I'm going to cop all your licks, at least all the ones from this solo. Same to you, Chris Shiflett. Oh, man. I appreciate Thank you. you so much, man. I love you too. Was Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke. You know the drill. Learn the solo, film the solo, post the solo, and make sure you tag me on your socials. And we will see you in two weeks with Blake Schwartzenbach from Jawbreaker. Adios, amigos. One, two, three. Shred with Shifty is created and hosted by me, Chris Shiflett, and produced in partnership with Double Elvis, Volume.com, and Premier Guitar. If you're digging the show, make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button so you get our new episodes when they come out every other week. Volume.com is a free platform with live stream performances, concert broadcasts, and a video archive that includes performances by Brothers Osborne, Stone Temple Pilots, Dirks Bentley, Weezer, and more. Shred with Shifty is produced by Jason Shadrick. Our executive producers are Brady Sadler and Jake Brennan for Double Elvis. Engineering support by Matt Tahaney and Matt Bowden. Our video editors are Dan DeStefano and Addison Savan. Special thanks to Chris Peterson, Greg Necron, and the entire Volume.com crew. Adios, amigos. Thank you.